All right, so I'm just going to show you this right quick uh, without exposing uh, too much. This is something I'm working on currently, reviewing somebody else's uh, complaint. The complaint is brought wrong effectively because, one, complaints are nothing more than bitching. We don't bitch. We make a claim, all right? So this is a motion to amend complaint. Uh, it'll be granted. Uh, it, it is in a federal court. Um, so, of course, we see the, the header up here, motion to amend complaint. Uh, we've got the defendant over here. Uh, the defendants are the defendants are going to grow. First of all, when he brought this claim, he didn't really know what he, he was doing. And he only went after one party, and there were uh, a total of four parties that are involved in this. you got the supervising officer, you got a secondary officer, and you got the primary officer, along with the police department itself. The corporate charter can be sued, all right? <clears throat> so there will be four uh, defendants when this is all said and done. But we're doing a motion to amend complaint. The reason that we're amending the complaint is, one, it's a complaint. He's effectively just bitching. We don't bitch. We make claims, all right? So we're going to amend this. And here's the reasons for it. it. comes now, John Doe Smith, here and after plaintiff with a motion to amend complaint and correct defects, all right? You have a right after filing an action to do uh, an amended complaint or an amended petition, Okay. Whereas initial complaint is vague and ambiguous, lacking authority and directive, the intent in amending said complaint is to establish, one, this court has jurisdiction, two, correctly identify the cause of action, three, correctly identify all parties involved, and four, ensure what should be done shall be done. That's a maximum of law right there, okay? I always make sure to stick in my maximums of law whenever I can. Uh, the plaintiff prays. Okay, this is, we're coming into equity here. We're praying, right? We're not requiring, we're not requesting, we're not demanding. We pray. This court uh, grants said motion to amend complaint for equity will not suffer a wrong without a remedy. Again, dropping another maximum in there just to let this court know, hey, uh, we've gained quite a bit of knowledge since the last time we corresponded with the court. We, we are now familiar with our uh, uh, mistakes that have been made, and we uh, we desire to correct those mistakes. We're coming into equity with clean hands, pure intent, clean heart, uh, just to see that what should be done shall be done, and and to ensure that, uh, that uh, equity will not suffer a wrong without a remedy, right? Then we give them a nice little, uh, without prejudice, I declare, certify, verify, or state under the penalty of perjury under the laws of the United States of America that the foregoing is true and correct. We're letting them know that we mean business. We're willing to do one year in jail or face a $10,000 fine if the findings are not correct, okay? And then we go... Hold on a second. I'll show you what I normally stick. Stick on a, on a claim, not a complaint, all right? And this is just for educational purposes. I'm not trying to teach anybody any legal bullshit because I don't believe in doing the undoing of God's law. But just for your viewing pleasure, um, when I structure something like this, okay, this is how I normally end it, okay? This comes from, this right here comes from Title 28, 17, 1746, subsection one all right this here came from our loving friend mr anonymous who cares so much about us all right and uh i understand it i hope you do too this is normally how in pleadings or anything all documents that i uh when i'm interacting with a court this is how i do it okay it's clean it's professional looking and it's not vague and ambiguous all right we're letting them know our intent our intent is what number one to show that this court has jurisdiction. How are we going to show this court that we have that they have jurisdiction? We're going to show I'm going to show you how to do that here in a minute. Correctly identify the cause of action. Okay, the cause of action uh, uh, was brought incorrectly. Okay, he uh, in this action there was a, a Bivens claim along with the 1983, and they actually when you read about the Bivens claim in the 1983, they cancel each other out. Okay, so any lawyer on a default judgment can come back in and, and argue uh, the conflict of variance between the, the laws and have this uh, uh, default judgment stricken if, if it ends up being a default judgment for lack of response. Now, in this instance, knowing that we're going to add the fourth party, which is going to be the, the police department itself and its corporate charter, Okay, because they had a duty to inform their officers. They had a duty to train them properly, and they failed to do so. And because they failed to do so, 
harm, damage, and loss was caused by their agents and agency that were sworn an oath to protect the American Constitution, the United States of America's Constitution, as well as the state's Constitution, okay? And uh, then we're going to correctly identify all parties involved because initially it was just uh, uh, an action being brought against the primary officer, but there was a secondary officer and then there was a third officer who was the supervisor who, who uh, acknowledged what the man was speaking of and said, look, you know, I agree with what you're saying. However, uh, I'm not going to interfere. This guy's going to take your car from the side of the road. You know, uh, please don't escalate the situation. So we have to incarcerate you or take you uh, into custody. Just let him do his job. Okay, so basically he's saying, I know he's about to put his dick in your ass, and he's over here put, petting your head going, it'll be okay. I know you don't want it. I know it doesn't feel good, but just let him do it, okay? That's what that commanding officer did. Basically allowed a rape of this man's rights to occur in front of him, making him an accessory to the crime, okay? And then that also constitutes misprison of a felony because this officer, this commanding officer, told this man, Hey, I know what's happening isn't necessarily right, but I'm not going to intervene. And he didn't take the time to call his superior officer to report what was going on so that no harm would be caused to this man. Instead, he sat by idly and watched it happen, which is a misprison of a felony when he allowed off the side of the road based upon the department. Department of Motor Vehicle Code, okay, which is not law. Department of Motor Vehicles is a single and separate unit contracted with the government, okay, to do business within the state, okay, Insur uh, to ensure that what should be done shall be done. We're just, we're just stating here that we are coming in, our intent, all right, is to come in here with uh, clean hands and, and a pure heart and make sure that everything is correct. We, we see some mistakes that are on the record that need to be corrected, Okay, plaintiff prays, again, this is drawing it into equity. We're not doing a, a demand or a request or requiring. We're praying at this point. This is equitable. Uh, this court grants said motion to amend complaint. Uh, and again, we're going to amend it because it shouldn't be a complaint in the first place. It should be a claim for equity will not suffer a wrong without a remedy. All right. So notice using a notary on this instrument does not constitute any adhesion nor does it alter my status in any manner the notary is for the purpose of providing verification and identification only but is not a party to this claim and not for entrance into any foreign jurisdiction or benefit thereof okay and then we always sign it before a notary or a few witnesses okay the bible always tells us two or more witnesses will suffice uh, some people go to the extreme. I've got some of my uh, constituents who will use six notaries to do things, and that's pretty powerful when you understand the position of a notary, okay? So, how are we going to amend this? Well, first of all, uh, when we're going to show how this uh, court has jurisdiction, um, we're going to come in here and we're going to change this header. I'll show you guys that in a little bit later. Uh, I'll draw it up. Because it takes me a minute to think about how exactly I want to word it. Because it's really poetry. It's poetry. Remember, the court is held on the four corners of the paper. And um, you want it to be simplistic. Simplistic is best. The more wordy it is, the more opportunity you give a lawyer to uh, misconstrue the language and, and create arguments that uh, aren't necessary. They're not needed. So this is very cut, dry, concise, and to the point. Okay? Um but how we would show the uh, that the court has jurisdiction is we would do something like, uh, let's see, we'd do something like this. This court has jurisdiction pursuant to Title 28, whoops. And I come over here and I like to get fancy. So I come over here and do insert, come over here and hit symbols, come in here and put that. And then I go title 28, uh, I think it is 1331, okay? Or 1343B, all right? So you guys might be curious as to what I'm talking about here. When we get back over here, 
And we look at Title 28, 1343, Civil Rights and Elective Franchises. Remember, how I, uh, the last video when we closed out, I was talking about I don't really like 1983 lawsuits because the, re the reason 1983 lawsuits were created were for uh, uh, purported slaves to bitch about civil rights. But when we read Title 28, USC, 1343, uh, and we go to three... Uh, a3, excuse me, it's not B. Uh, to redress the deprivation under the color of any state law, statute, ordinance, regulation, custom, or usage of any right, privilege, or immunity secured by the Constitution of the United States or by any act of Congress providing for equal rights of citizens or, uh, or of all persons within the jurisdiction of the United States. Okay? So, then we look at... Uh, Let's do this real quick for you. Title 28, 1331. Oh, I don't have internet up. Some bitch. Anyway, if you go to 1331, you'll see, and it says other persons. <clears throat> um, when you're looking at Title 28, 1343, it says, for the purposes of this section... The District of Columbia shall be considered a state, okay? And two, any act of Congress applicable exclusively to the District of Columbia shall be considered to be a statute of the District of Columbia. So they're telling you what, what 1983 lawsuits actually apply to is U.S. citizens, which are fucking slaves, which get privileges known as civil rights, okay? So anyway, let's get started here. We'll come back. Sorry, I don't have the other one pulled up. I don't have my internet running right now. Um... What else was I going to show you? Right here. So we all understand what the importance is of uh, when I'm reading the case sites, why I go through the, the, the point of sounding like an auctioneer when I read the cases. All these little numbers, all these, all these things right here have meaning, okay? This being the year, uh, this uh, beginning of the page, okay? U.S., name of reporter, and volume number, 408, okay? And uh, then, of course, the case name. This is the guy, typically, the, the first name you see is the guy moving the action. And typically, this is the wrongdoer, all right? So that's why I take the time to uh, read all those, read everything out for you guys. One, it helps put it in my head. And two, uh, if anybody wants to go look it up to verify, they have the ability to do that, all right? Above are the parts of standard case citations. The citation tells us that the, that a case called Furman versus Georgia was decided in 1972 and can be found in Volume 408 of the United States Report, stating, uh, starting on page 238. Some variations. When using a direct quote from the case, it is important to provide the specific page on which the, that quote is found. In that case, the citation would have uh, the page added as follows. Furman versus Georgia, 408 U.S. 238, 240, 1972, or Furman versus Georgia, 408 U.S. at 240, 1972. Because federal appeals court circuit courts are found in one of 12 different districts, the specific district is typically added as follows. Cooper versus Pate, whoops, sorry about that. Cooper v. Pate, 382, F period, 2D, 443, 7th Circuit, 1967. Uh, 94 federal district courts are spread throughout the country. There is at least one in every state, and the more populated states have as many as four. The specific district should be identified. Howard v. United States, 864, F period, SUPP period, 1019D period, COLO period, 1994. Case name. There are typically two names for a case. Usually the first name identifies who is bringing the court action, and the second name is the is the person against whom action is being brought. In a criminal case law, action is, is almost always brought by the state. Ergo, people or state against a person. Ergo, Joe, as in people versus uh, Joe or state versus Joe. Now, what I think is funny about this is they actually show it to you in proper context. However, uh, we know that everything here is typically capitalized uh, uh, showing that they're uh, 
trust being manifested into existence or uh, uh, false and fictitious misnomers being utilized or unregistered corporations being used, okay? Changing the jurisdiction. However, the defendant may not always stay the same. In the Furman, Georgia case, uh, Furman was originally the defendant in a murder case uh, being prosecuted in Georgia. However, Furman appealed his conviction and in doing so became the person taking action against the state. This, uh, the year, this is the year in which the decision was delivered by the court. It may not be, and in appellate uh, cases probably isn't, the year in which the case was heard. Name of reporter. A reporter is a, uh, is a multi-volume publication where the court decisions are found. The full name and abbreviations of the re abbreviations for a report for the reporters you are most likely to encounter as uh, undergraduates are. Okay, so this is this is what why what the importance of reading all that is. Okay, United States reports is normally identified as U dot S dot. U.S. Supreme Court, Supreme Court reporter is S period, CT period, U.S. Supreme Court. Federal report, first uh, first through third series is F period, comma, that's the federal report, F period 2D. So this is this is this signifies the first report. This signifies the secondary report. This is what it'll look like. F period 2D and F period 3D, all right? And that's the Federal Reporter, first through uh, third series. Federal Appeals Court. <clears throat> so these are different uh, different areas to help you identify where the case is located in the in the in the transcripts. Federal uh, Supplement, first and second series. F period S U P P comma, or you'll see it as as this F period S U P P two. Important decisions from federal district courts. So anytime you're seeing this right here it's important to know that this is coming from the federal district court anytime that you're seeing anything like this it's coming from a federal appeals court okay anytime you're seeing anything like this it's u.s supreme court all right and u.s supreme courts rule all over every court any u.s supreme court case that you utilize to bind the court, they must abide by. Okay, if they don't, it's an appealable issue. They're violating your rights because the U.S. Supreme Court uh, uh, is predicated on upholding the law of the land. All right, which all courts are bound by. Atlantic Reporter, California Reporter, Northeast Reporter, Pacific Reporter, etc., are all identified with this here. Okay, so A is Atlantic, uh, C A L is California uh, Reporter. Uh, NE is Northeastern Reporter, and P is Pacific Reporter. And these are all appellate level state court cases appear in one of the various state regional reporters. Okay, so these are all state appellate court cases. Okay, so I just wanted to show that and share that with you guys. So when we're going through all these cases, if you go to look them up, you kind of have an inclination of what you're doing and what you're looking for, all right? These, this is the hierarchy of the courts right here. U.S. Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, Federal Appeals Court, important federal district court cases, and then, of course, you have the appellate courts for the state. Volume numbers and uh, uh, beginning pages. Without knowing what volume of the report to look in and what page the case starts on, it would be very difficult to track the case down. Not impossible, however, as you can use the table of case in digest like West, uh, West United States Supreme Court digest or for uh, very recent cases, U.S. Law Week, similar digest exists for other federal and state court cases. So this is very important when you find court cases. This is the information that you want to write down and make sure that you have uh, in order to track down the exact uh, quote or statement being made within the court. Uh, let's see here. Boom, 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 boom. When we come back, we're going to get back into this, which is the 1983. And then I've got a 12 page ditty on the Monell 1983 lawsuit, which is uh, pretty impressive. Um, it's stuff that I'm studying because I'm involved in something right now. Uh, with this. And so we're going to show that this court has jurisdiction pursuant to Title 28, 1343, and this should say A3, but I'm not going to use A3 because A3 
is not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for 1331. And in 1331, it says, and other persons. And I like the word and other persons, okay? Uh, because this guy is not a United States citizen, all right? He's a Union State member. He's protected by the Constitution. He's domiciled in the Tenth Amendment. He has an absolute right to get redress of grievance for the egregious violations of a state actor, okay? And he's really not a state actor because he's working on behalf, the officer in question was working on behalf of a private corporation, okay? And that private corporation is contracted through the municipality, through the through the uh, city uh, to provide services, all right, to enforce things like statutes, codes, city ordinances, rules, and regulations, which are not crimes, okay? Their charter says that they're there to prevent crime, yet they're engaged in an act and uh, egregiously act uh, while committing crimes while purportedly being in the position they're in to prevent crimes, okay? Which is the very definition of Title 28, uh, or excuse me, Title 18, 241, and 242, conspiracy against unalienable rights, uh, deprivation of rights under the color of law, Okay. So we're showing again when we do this when we do this correction to the record here. First of all, this is going to go from being a complaint to being a claim. We're going to show that the court has jurisdiction. We're going to establish that, and then we're going to do the counts. What happened? What occurred? Okay. So first, the first count will be false false arrest, false imprisonment. The second count will be uh, you know theft by taking. Uh, it'll actually be uh, aggravated theft. The man was uh, wearing a firearm at the time that he, he took this man's property without reasonable articulable suspicion and without uh, reasonable articulable fact that the man was engaged in commerce, okay? And this man did a very good job of letting him know, hey, I'm not engaged in commerce. You're way outside the scope of your jurisdiction and authority. There is no injured party making a claim against I. So he really made it really easy to substantiate all these things. And then what we're going to give them is uh, according to when we go... Do -do 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 -do, Oops, oops, oops. No. Oh, bah, 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 bah. Where's it at? Do, do, do. That's declaratory judgment. That's banking. I don't have it on screen. Anyway, um, I'll talk more about that later to help you guys structure your claims. And as soon as you bring claims and you know the law, uh, it's really easy to... Uh, to get remedy and 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 the thing is here the only remedy that can be had is money damages so when we when we amend this what it'll end up saying is this court has jurisdiction this claim is being brought forward for money damages because it's the only uh remedy for relief that can be had this man can't get his time back he can't you know he's got his automobile back but that's beside the point all the time that he lost is something he'll never get back again all right so we're going to tell the court why why they have jurisdiction over the subject matter or why this court has jurisdiction. It's a 1983 claim being brought forward. And then we're going to identify the counts. Um, and we're also going to tell them what we're seeking. We're seeking money damages and the amount of whatever the uh, money damages accumulate to based upon the violations of his rights. Okay. When we come back, we'll get back into uh, this right here.